Hey there, true crime lovers. Let's be real when you think of unsolved mysteries. The Zodiac Killer has got to be one of the first names that pops into your head. This guy basically wrote the playbook on how to freak out an entire generation. Decades have passed since his killing spree in the late 60s, but that one big question still lingers. Could the Zodiac Killer still be alive? hiding in plain sight? Honestly, I would not put it past him. The way he toyed with the media, the police, and everyone who tried to figure him out, it was like a twisted game of cat and mouse. Fast forward to today, Netflix just released a new documentary series called This Is The Zodiac Speaking, which is making us question everything all over again. Could there be new clues that change everything we thought we knew? Could the Zodiac Killer still be walking among us? Well, grab your popcorn, get comfy, and let's dig into one of the creepiest on solve cases out there. If you love a good mystery, do not forget to hit like and subscribe to our channel because there is a lot more where this came from. Where it all began. All right, let's roll it back to the late 1960s in California. The summer of love just ended and everything seemed pretty chill until the Zodiac Killer showed up. Now, this guy was not just out to commit crimes. He wanted fame. He wanted a spotlight, the drama, and to scare people senseless, and he knew exactly how to do that. Here's the kicker, though. Only four of his attacks are officially confirmed, but the Zodiac claimed he killed about 37 people. Now, that makes you wonder, doesn't it? Does this mean his skin killing spree started earlier than we thought? Could there be victims we do not know about? One theory, like many others, is that it all began in June 1963, when Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards, two teenagers enjoying a sunny senior ditch day on a beach near Gaviota State Park, were attacked. They were bound and shot. Robert 11 times and Linda was shot 9 times before their bodies were found in a shack. The killer used Winchester Weston Super X ammunition, which is eerily similar to what would be used in later Zodiac crimes, which is why people speculate it had to be him. But it was never proven. Fast forward to October 1966 in Riverside, Cherry Jo Bates, a college student, was found brutally murdered near her campus. She had been beaten and stabbed, and her car had been tampered with in an attempt to leave her stranded. Just a month later, the local newspapers and police received letters from someone claiming responsibility, signed with a cryptic Z. Years later, Zodiac would mention Riverside in his letters, hinting that this might have been his handiwork. So, does this mean he was accepting that Cherry was his first victim? Alright, now on to the confirmed attacks. It all began in December 19. 1968 with the Lake Herman Road attack. Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, two teenagers out on a date, parked her car for a quiet moment. Not long after, another driver noticed two seemingly lifeless bodies on the side of the road and called for help. When the Benicia police arrived, they found Betty Lou dead with five bullet wounds in her back. David was found next to their car, the Rambler with a bullet wound in his head, still breathing, but barely clinging to life. Sadly, he did not make it. But what makes this even more scary is that there there were bullet holes in the roof and back window of the car. It was like the killer fired warning shots to try and get them out of the vehicle. It was brutal and it left investigators scratching their heads. Was it random? Was there a reason behind it? At that point, it seemed like these two teenagers were just random targets killed by a stranger for some unknown reason. But little did anyone know, this was just the beginning. Next up, July 1969 at the Blue Rock Springs. It was a warm summer night and another young couple, Darlene Farron and Michael Magot, were sitting in their parked car just hanging out and enjoying the evening. Out of nowhere, the Zodiac shows up blasting away with a 9mm handgun. Michael managed to survive, but Darlene sadly did not make it. Then, as if the attack itself was not chilling enough, at 12.40 a.m., Zodiac calls up the Vallejo police from a gas station payphone to claim responsibility. The cops said that he spoke in a flat, emotionless voice and said, I want to report a murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you'll find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm lugger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. It's like he was playing a game with them just daring the police to catch him. That level of cold-blooded confidence? Totally on brand for the Zodiac. Then, we have September 1969, Lake Berryessa. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were enjoying a peaceful day by the lake when a man approached him wearing an executioner-style hood and a black bib with his symbol, the infamous cross circle. He tied him up and then stabbed Brian six times and Cecilia ten times. Brian miraculously survived, but Cecilia succumbed to her injuries days later. 
earlier. Zodiac left his mark literally by drawing a symbol in Bryant's car door along with the dates of his previous attacks. He even called the police later to report the crime himself. This guy was acting like he was in the movie or something. And finally, there was the Presidio Heights murder in October 1969. Paul Stein, a 28-year-old student and husband, was working as a cab driver in San Francisco that night. He picked up a fare headed to the Presidio Heights neighborhood, but at the intersection of Washington and Cherry Streets, the passenger suddenly pulled out a gun and shot Stein in the head. The killer then took a piece of Paul's shirt like some kind of sick trophy and walked away, casually disappearing just before the police arrived. But here is where it gets even messier. The police radio broadcast mistakenly described the suspect as a black man, so when officers passed a white guy who actually matched the description, they just let him go. Can you imagine that? A mix-up like that potentially let the Zodiac slip away right under their noses. They did find fingerprints on the driver's side of the cab and witnesses helped create a sketch of the suspect, but it was not enough to pin him down. Initially, it looked like a simple robbery until the San Francisco Chronicle got an envelope from the Zodiac with a letter that read, I am the murderer of the taxi driver, and it included a blood-stained piece of Paul Stein's shirt as proof. Zodiac even claimed he wore a disguise that night and said the police sketch was all wrong. He also denied leaving any fingerprints. It was a classic Zodiac taunting the cops and keeping the public hooked on his every word. This was his last confirmed killing, but trust me, he was not done messing with everyone just yet. Coming back to the Zodiac's letters and his pathetic little game, he sent a total of four ciphers, packed with threats and hints, challenging people to figure them out. Some of these ciphers have been cracked like the infamous 340 cipher was finally solved in 2020, where Zodiac rambled about not fearing death and being ready for his next life in paradise, but others are still out there, unsolved, waiting to be cracked. And it was not just California that got his attention. In 1973, the Albany Times Union got a letter postmarked with the Zodiac's signature crossed circle. The letter read, You are wrong. I'm not dead or in the hospital. I am alive and well, and I'm going to start killing again. He even mentioned Albany Medical Center as the site of his next victim. The FBI tried so hard to figure it out, but oddly no murders were ever linked to that letter, and experts could not conclusively match the handwriting to the Zodiac. He craved attention, and honestly, he nailed it. We're still here all these years later, obsessed with the mystery that he created. All signs point to Allen, the Zodiac's main suspect. When you talk about suspects, Arthur Lay Allen is the name that comes up more than anyone else. For years, he was the prime suspect, and for good reason. First off, Michael Magoo, the survivor from the Blue Rock Springs attack, identified Allen from a photo lineup. He pointed at Allen and said, that's the guy. But because of conflicting witness testimonies, police couldn't pin anything on him, and Allen ended up walking free. It was frustratingly close, but not enough to make the changes stick. Then the Cops noticed that Allen owned a Zodiac brand watch, which had the same symbol that the killer used to cross inside a circle. So, okay, I know what you're thinking, it could just be a coincidence, but if it is, it's a pretty big one, right? Then there's the fact that Allen was an elementary school teacher who had a record for child molestation. Yeah, the man is a predator. He served three years in prison for this, and according to his former students, he liked to teach them how to crack codes. Sounds familiar? It is a little too close for comfort. The recent Netflix documentary, this is the Zodiac speaking also shed some light on Alan's connection to the Seawater family, which we will get to in the next section. They knew Alan pretty well and let's just say their stories made him seem even more suspicious. Is Alan the father figure or a serial killer? The Seawater family speaks out. The Seawater family stories are honestly some of the most chilling parts of the new docu-series. Arthur Lay Allen wasn't just a random suspect to them. The Seawater kids saw Alan as a father figure. He was just that fun guy who took them on trips, introduced them to new music, and even taught them things. But in hindsight, those field trips were not just fun days out. The Seawaters realized that many of the places Alan took them were linked to the Zodiac murders later. Later on. For instance, in 1963, he took them to Tahiguas Point and guess what happened the very next day? Remember the two teenagers, Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards we spoke about earlier? They turned up dead there. Another time in 1966, Allen took them to Riverside City College and literally that same night, Cherry Joe Bates was murdered nearby. This cannot just be a coincidence, right? Sends a shiver down my spine just thinking about it. In 1991, Connie even asked Allen straight up if he was the Zodiac 
Zodiac while they were still out sailing. He laughed it off saying, if I told you it, I'd have to kill you. David Seawater remembers a conversation in 1992 just before Alan died. He says that Alan broke down crying over the phone and confessed to drugging the kids and even molesting Connie. I mean, Jesus. There you have it, one more reason to hate this guy. And when David asked if he was the Zodiac, Alan did not deny it. Instead, he said he was. David was understandably devastated. Imagine hearing that from someone you once loved and trusted. It is beyond horrifying. And it was not just a confession. Connie also had this memory of sewing a hood for Alan, which sounds eerily similar to the hood Zodiac wore during the Lake Berryessa attack. Plus, Alan owned a black wetsuit, much like the one described during that same incident. Believe it or not, there is more. Before his death, Alan made a VHS tape from Phyllis Seawater, and on the label he used letter stickers in a way that some believe could contain a hidden message, a potential final confession as the Zodiac. This is what people call the Kodak Tapes theory. The label was strange enough that people started connecting the dots, saying it was typical of Alan's cryptic behavior. Similar to how the Zodiac loved his ciphers was Alan trying to leave a final message that no one else caught. With everything the Seawater family experienced, it is easy to see why they were convinced Alan was the Zodiac. Honestly, after all this evidence, even I am almost convinced. But here's the thing. This case is not that simple. Alan was not the only name on the suspect list, not by a long shot. Who else could it be? The Zodiac Killer's long list of suspects. So not everyone buys that Arthur Lay Allen was the Zodiac Killer. Sure, the evidence is pretty compelling, but there are still a lot of loose ends. For example, the DNA found on the Zodiac letters did not match Allen. Then again, the tech back then was not perfect, and the envelopes could have been handed by someone else. We just don't know for sure. Anyway, moving on to some of the other suspects. First up is Earl Van Best Jr. His own son, Gary Stewart, wrote a book called The Most Dangerous Animal of All, where he lays out why he thinks his dad was the Zodiac Zodiac. Stewart pointed to things like handwriting matches, DNA, and even a police sketch that looked eerily like his father. But when the theory was put under a microscope like in the FX documentary experts found serious holes. But even after that, Stewart was stuck by his story. I guess once you believe something that personal, it is hard to let go. Then there was Gary Francis Post. In 2021, a group called the Case Breakers pointed fingers at him. They claimed his forehead scars matched the ones in the Zodiac sketch and they believed he was behind Sherry Joe Bates' murder in 1966. The FBI did not confirm any of this, though, and honestly, they've been super tight-lipped about whether Post was even a real suspect. And let's not forget Lawrence Kane. He was identified by Kathleen Johns, a survivor of a Zodiac abduction, and by the sister of Darlene Farron, one of the Zodiac's victims. Kane had a shady background he worked near where some victims were last seen and had impulse control issues after a head injury. Some even think a Zodiac cipher hinted at his name, but again, nothing conclusive. Another wild one is Giuseppe Bevilacqua. An Italian journalist claimed that Bevilacqua admitted to being not just the Zodiac, but also the monster of Florence, a serial killer in Italy. No recordings of this confession exist, though, and authorities dismissed it. It is a juicy theory, but without solid evidence, it's just that. Then, the there's Paul Doerr. He was named in a book by Jared Kobeck as a suspect because his height and weight matched witness descriptions and his writing bore similarities to the Zodiac's letters. Plus, Doerr was part of a right-wing group that sent out letters with a symbol similar to the Zodiac's. His daughter even stopped plans to sue the author, which kind of makes you wonder if there is some truth there. Richard Gajkowski is another one. He was a journalist in the Bay Area during the Zodiac killings and was even said to be close to some of the crime scenes. There is a story floating around that a victim's sister recognized him at the funeral. We've also got Ross Sullivan and Richard Marshall. Ross worked at Riverside City College where Cherry Jo Bates was killed and he vanished for days after her death. People thought he looked like the Zodiac sketch. Then there was Richard Marshall who lived near where Paul Stein was murdered. He had his thing for ciphers and all things cryptic, just like the Zodiac. There could also be the possibility that maybe the Zodiac was someone who flew completely under the radar, never even making it into the suspect list. That's the most frustrating part of this case. This guy was a master at staying one step ahead and keeping everyone guessing. Even with today's technology, we still cannot seem to put the pieces together. The Zodiac was all about the mind games, and honestly, he is winning. The mystery continues. Could he still be alive? Coming to the big question, could a Zodiac killer still be alive? Well, Arthur Lay Allen died in 1992, and if he was the Zodiac, then maybe the secret went to the grave with him. But we just don't have the proof to say. But yep, it was definitely him. 
Yeah, there are so many clues that point his way, but we're still missing that one undeniable piece of evidence. And if Alan was not the Zodiac, that means the real Zodiac could still be out there. He would obviously be like super old now, probably in the 80s or 90s, but not necessarily gone. We've seen other cases like the Golden State Killer, where someone managed to live a full life before getting caught late in the game. I mean, since Alan's death, there have not been any more confirmed Zodiac murders. Maybe that means he was the guy, or maybe the Zodiac just decided to stop. Who knows? It is one of those questions that keeps people coming back to this case year after year. Marvel's Verdict So here's where I'll leave you guys. Do you think Arthur Lay Allen was the Zodiac, or could it have been someone else entirely? Maybe the real Zodiac is still out there, blending in, living out his days in anonymity. Honestly, it feels like the Zodiac made sure we would never stop talking about him, that he kept us guessing. Left us those cryptic notes, and here we are all these years later, still hooked. Let me know what you think in the comments, and remember to like and share this with your fellow mystery buffs. Let's see if we can piece this puzzle together, one clue at a time. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.